Minister McClintock for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. When we speak of uh, threats to democracy, it seems to me the ultimate threat is a government that's detached from the will of the electorate. Uh, when we speak of independent bureaucracies, I think we have to ask the question, well, I independent of whom? Well, obviously independent of the elected officials who are in turn elected by and answerable to the people. So, so we're talking about the separation of our democracy, the rule of the people, from the government that's, that now is in effect running itself. Uh, it's also then operating not only outside the rule of democracy, the people, but it's also operating outside the bounds of the Constitution, which gives all legislative powers to the Congress of the United States. Uh, under the separation of powers at the center of our constitutional architecture, Congress makes law but cannot enforce it. The president uh, enforces law but cannot make it. And the executive uh, uh, authority to, or pardon me, the exclusive authority to adjudicate disputes uh, that are arising under our laws belong to the judiciary. Now, Mr. Phillips just told us, well, there's no problem here. Nobody's forcing these settlements, uh, but that's not the point. The point is these settlements are, are making laws quite independent from the elected representatives. It, it uh, may even be in diametrical opposition to the policies of the elected president. That, that means our, our government has become a, a law unto it itself. Um, Mr. Grossman, am I, I correct that a, a bureaucracy needs only to collude with like-minded pressure groups in order to establish a new rule, an enforceable law, even if it's at odds with the elected representatives of the people? In some instances, agencies have in fact done that to adopt legal interpretations that have very serious consequences to regulated parties as well as the broader economy. Yes. Isn't this a quintessential threat to democracy when, when laws are imposed, not by the elected representatives of the people, but entirely contrary to, to their wishes as they express them through the uh, vote? It, yes, yes, I, I think that is exactly right. And I think you see that it particularly, uh, as you pointed out, uh, in the what, what's called known as the, the slush fund settlement context, because in that instance, you know, the programs that are being created by these settlements, they may be well and good. Some people may look at them and say they are laudable and they lead to good public policy results. The problem is they were never enacted by Congress. And, and therefore, you, again, you have a runaway bureaucracy completely uh, detached from control by the electorate. Exactly. Not only standing up its own, pro its own programs with its own uh, policy objectives, but then funding those programs independently of Congress. So and, there is no check and no oversight. And, and by the way, if, if, if it accuses you of violating the law it is now made by itself, you're held to account in an administrative law court, are you not, run by that very same agency? Uh, that is often the case, yes. And then as we get into some of the other issues, uh, if, it, if the agency's court finds you guilty of violating the agency's law, the agency gets to decide what to do with those funds that it has now collected from you without the process of, uh, of, of due process of law uh, or, or trial by juries. Is that correct? Uh, in settlements, yes. I mean, the money can be directed to third parties. And so, you know, when Congress typically enacts a fine, the money goes into the Treasury, um, and then it's subject to appropriations. Uh, but under these sorts of agreements, there isn't that type of democratic oversight. Mr. Shu, we, we had a California insurance commissioner many years ago who was forced to resign when he uh, was found to be directing a, a settlement with insurance companies uh, to contribute to an ad campaign that featured himself as he prepared to, to run for governor. Is that the kind of abuse we're talking about? I mean, it certainly could be, you know, and in, uh, and, and by the way, in, in any other context. This and he was a Republican. As you pointed out, uh, uh, Chris Christie directed funds from a, a settlement to his alma mater, a, a Republican. Um, so isn't this something Democrats should be just as concerned about as Republicans? Uh, yes, Congressman. That's why I mentioned that, you know, whether somebody's from Atlanta or media or Thousand Oaks, the fact of the matter is that this is a nonpartisan issue. Democrats should be concerned. There's also the funding issue in the sense that, you know, in 2011, Congress had cut certain grantees from the budget. This, this President, President, uh, President Obama signed it into law, but these settlements did an end run around the appropriations. Th 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 this frightens me because it is a brave new world that, that's replacing the constitutional republic that our founders envisioned. And, and I think our chance to set things right is quickly passing from our hands. So I think the proceedings today are, are, are extremely important. 
I know the authoritarian left applauds these developments because they believe the policy outcomes favor their goals, but they should beware of such powers because those powers, once summoned, are not easily contained and could one day be turned against them. Yes, sir. Back. The gentleman yields back, and the chair recognizes the gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Johnson, for five minutes.